Wall Street on this Friday has come to the White House. To use a Wall Street expression, there might be an arbitrage spread between how well we are doing and how well some of you guys think we're doing, and we're going to work hard to close that spread. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. In Los Angeles, I'm Kyle Resnall. Friday, the 21st of July. Good as always to have you along, everybody. On Monday, this was Made in America Week at the White House. As we sit here on Friday, well, the message is a little bit muddled. Here for a look at our five days gone by, Lynette Lopez from Business Insider. Also, Neela Richardson from Redfin. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hi, Kai. So, Neela, let me start with you. Uh, and I want to do actually uh, not a Made in America question, but a, a quick pass on trade. Uh, our negotiations on trade with the Chinese wrapped up this week uh, after 100 days with, in essence, nothing. Um, we learned that uh, NAFTA negotiations are going to start on the 16th of August. Um, those are going to be contentious. Where do you think we are on the Trump administration's trade agenda? Uh, we are with a dog with a bone is what we are. There is a single-minded focus on the trade deficit. And if the trade deficit is large, then it's going to be a contentious negotiation as it was with China, as it will be with Mexico. And that is just not a broad-based view for how to view trade policy. You know, capital moves in between countries in all kinds of ways. China invests a lot in U.S. debt. That's what keeps borrowing costs low mm-hmm. from millions of of Americans. That's not a part of this discussion. What's part of this discussion is steel and tariffs. And that's going to be influence our negotiations with Mexico as much as China. Uh, the single mindedness is means that we don't push forward mm-hmm. in a direction that everyone's a winner. So, Lynette, we're going to talk taxes here in a little bit. I want to talk about uh, another part of the, the Trump administration economic agenda. Uh, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan uh, was in um, Lawrence, Massachusetts this week talking about tax reform and the package he wants to get going. And he said, and this is almost a quote, Republicans are all on the same page about what we want out of taxes. Um, a, is that true? And B, how far are we from uh, getting there if it's not true? Well, that's definitely not true. We have a value. There's the value added tax that some Republicans want to push to be able to raise revenue. This would be the the border adjustment tax you're talking about. Yes. Uh, Yes. It's like a European style value added tax. Um, Some Republicans like it. Some don't. And some Republicans are want to use this budget negotiations to mess with Democrats even more and get what they want. Some don't. Some want to get it done as soon as possible so that they can move on to tax reform or like it's just there seems to be a lot of infighting about policy and the stakes as well, what they can get away with and what they can push using this as leverage. Also, Neela, we're, we're still having a conversation where the White House is talking tax cuts and congressional Republicans are talking tax reform, which are not the same thing. No, they're not. But you can't do one without the other, because the key question, no matter who's president, is how do you how do you pay for a tax cut? Yeah. Well, If you want to be revenue neutral, that means you don't want to blow up the deficit or cut spending. You have to figure out what to cut, what to eliminate in terms of credits. And nobody likes to make cuts. Always a messy process (laughs) to credit. So so, so these two sides of the coin have to get together in order for a policy to be passed. There's no way around it. All right, Lynette, so to that piece of tape that I played uh, up at the top, that was Anthony Scaramucci as of uh, this morning, the new communications director at the White House, formerly uh, of his own firm on Wall Street called Skybridge Capital. You write of him today uh, at Business Insider. You said Scaramucci, known affectionately on Wall Street as The Mooch, is charming, loquacious, effusive, combative, single-minded, transactional, over-the-top, and loyal to a fault. Tell us more. I've known uh, Anthony for years. If he wants to charm you, he's the most charming man in the entire world. But I think the thing to focus on right now is the fact that his firm, Skybridge, actually hasn't been sold yet. And he was he's plans to sell, send, sell it to a financier with ties to Hugo Chavez and also HNA, a Chinese conglomerate that has come under scrutiny from the European Central Bank and the Chinese government. So the Treasury has to approve this sale because they have to uh, approve the sale of American companies mm-hmm. to foreign buyers every time. So it, Anthony's not starting in for two weeks. I imagine that Steve Mnuchin is going to have to sign on the dotted line um, sometime within that time. Um, it's a $180 million around there sale. Yeah. That It looks like the investors are overpaying for it. Hmm. So there are a lot of questions that people need to be asking about the sale of Skybridge. Um, who is being... who? 
who exactly is buying right. this and the, um you know what is their relationship with anthony why are they overpaying for this and you know is it is it smart for the treasury to approve a deal with a company that the european central bank is investigating as well as its own government i mean and, these are questions we need to ask if he's going to be this close to president trump and we should say he did this months and months ago he initiated the sale months and months ago in the hopes of getting a different white house job he has not right come but it circle. hasn't closed right, it has not closed and, that's exactly right all and right so we, i mean there are a number of jobs he was looking into but this is this, this seemed is to materialize in 24 hours right lynette lopez at business and saturnila richardson at redfin thanks you too thank, thank you, you. Have, right, a great have a nice weekend. weekend on wall street today a rare down day not by too terribly much though details numbers you know the drill The U.S. Chamber of Commerce had just about had it with the Congress of the United States in an open letter ostensibly to all lawmakers, but one can read between the lines here. Chamber CEO Tom Donahue said, in essence, y'all have got to get something done. Something being fixing health care, getting tax reform going, and a real infrastructure program as well. And Donahue wrote, a year from now, the chamber is going to be evaluating candidates based on their support for, and this is another quote, the free enterprise system. Marketplace's Adam Allington reports on the odd situation the usually GOP-friendly chamber finds itself in. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is among the most powerful lobbying groups in the country. Kurt Bolu is senior counsel for Bracewell and Giuliani, a conservative lobbying firm. The chamber has three million members, but Bolu says that's just the start. The chamber represents so many businesses, and those businesses employ a lot of people. And then those businesses also serve a lot of customers. A Republican government would seem to be an ideal partner for the chamber's pro-business MO, but given the recent uphill battle over health care and the protectionist leanings of some Republicans, the chamber delivered a clear message. We have to get to tax reform. This is not a, this is not an optional discussion. Neil Bradley is chief policy officer at the Chamber of Commerce. He says the chamber's letter also hinted at consequences for politicians who might try to hold up the process. Frankly, it was a reminder, you know, to elected officials about what's at stake here. This isn't an optional exercise. Translation: Anyone who doesn't fall in line on tax reform will incur a cost. This letter is really setting the stage for the 2018 cycle. Alyssa Katz is the author of a book about the chamber called The Influence Machine. She says the chamber carries a war chest of cash to spend on congressional elections. And the chamber is ready, willing, and able to throw up a wall of attack ads against any member of Congress it deems to be insufficiently supportive of its agenda. Katz points out in recent years, the chamber has spent money to defeat Freedom Caucus Republicans they view as obstructionists. In Washington, I'm Adam Allington for Marketplace. We talked taxes up at the top a little bit, Lynette, Neela, and I. This week, the House approved a draft 2018 budget, the first step toward a comprehensive tax overhaul, one key Republican plank of which is corporate tax reform. But it's going to be no small lift to get to the 15 percent corporate tax rate that President Trump has promised, down from the 35 percent rate that that is today. We asked Marketplace's Adrian Hill to do the math on this one for us. I've got a handy little formula for you. Each percentage point the government cuts the corporate tax rate costs about $100 billion in government revenue over a decade give or take. So cutting the corporate tax rate by 20 percentage points, 20 times 100 billion, gets you to $2 trillion. That's a 5% reduction in total federal revenue. Joseph Rosenberg is with the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. In my opinion, it's overly ambitious to the point of being unrealistic. Scott Greenberg from the Tax Foundation says there could be economic benefits to cutting the corporate tax rate. But even then, it'll cost us. The revenue loss from cutting the corporate rate could be as small as, say, 60 or $50 billion for each percentage point reduction. So 50 or $60 billion times 20, that's still one to $1.2 trillion. Greenberg thinks it might be possible to get to that 15% rate. But that would mean a lot of difficult choices about how to offset the cost of that. Which tax provisions to take out, which spending to cut, 
experts think a corporate rate somewhere in the 20s might be more achievable. But even then, you got to remember that statutory tax rate isn't the rate corporations actually pay after deductions and other tax breaks. In a study out in March, the CBO calculated the average corporate tax rate was closer to 29 percent. I'm Adrian Hill for Marketplace. Today was a rare day in the red for the major indices, down just a little bit. One day, however, does not a trend make, which brings no comfort to traders betting the markets are due for a fall. Short sellers is what those folks are called, and they're becoming scarce as stocks keep going up. Ben Eisen wrote about the lack of short interest in the Wall Street Journal today. Hey, Ben. Hi, how are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. Tell me, first of all, just so everybody knows what we're talking about, uh, what is shorting a stock or an index? Sure. So short selling is basically taking the other side of a bet on the market. Most people put money into the market thinking that uh, stocks will go up, but if you think they're going to go down, you can bet against the market. It's uh, it's a practice that has sort of a storied uh, role on Wall Street. A lot of short sellers have kind of taken down companies in the past, basically mm-hmm. by betting against the shares and you know hoping they'd fall. And you say in this piece that uh, we're at a four-year low uh, in in overall shorting in the market. Yeah, this is just uh, one measure of, of short interest, but it's, it's actually short interest on a specific ETF that tracks the broader market. But, Exchange traded uh, but fund. It's, it's a it's a kind of it's a trading device, actually. Exactly. Yeah, right. but it's it's pretty representative of what's going on as stocks kind of continue to hit record highs. It's it's become difficult to short the market and short stocks when stocks really just keep going up. Can you explain the disconnect for me between what uh, we see in the stock market, which is uh, progress to the upside versus what we see in the general economy, which is um, growth but sluggish, jobs are being added but not as much as we really need. How do you make uh, those two make sense? I mean, you really saw a surge in the stock market right after the election. There was a lot of movement higher in stocks based on sort of hope that uh, policies would be put into place uh, with the new administration, that we'd get inflation going faster, that we'd get economic growth going faster. Things like tax reform, infrastructure Mm -hmm. spending, these were things that that for months traders were talking about as being sort of the reason stocks were rallying. And yet we really haven't gotten that, Um, but it hasn't exactly been ruled out yet. Uh, So... Hope is still there, and you know that's that's really what's supporting this for now. It seems, and one other thing I'd mention, sort of as a tangent, though, is is you you do have corporate earnings, uh, which is another sort of fundamental thing on which mm-hmm. stocks rally, and and they've been doing pretty well. So even though the economy isn't doing great, you're still seeing uh, corporate profits grow. With the caveat here that everybody ought to contact their own financial advisor before they make any investment decisions. Um, what do you see in terms of people looking uh, on the upside? I mean, do we see people piling money into the market, uh, even as the shorts are saying, I don't know what's going on here? You're seeing a lot of money flow into the market. Um, you know, weekly fund flow data, basically the amount of money that, that people are putting into mutual funds mm-hmm. and exchange traded funds each week, really shows uh, people just keep putting money into the market. And you know, I think that's that's one sign that the people who have maybe held out from from this rally, thinking that stocks would go down, are starting to believe that okay, well, maybe stocks are going up. Yeah, and they go down too. We have to say that. That's and, the disclaimer, right? Right, of course. And 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 there is a sense in the market too that when everyone thinks that stocks can only go up, uh, that's the time when they go down. Uh, it's sense of complacency taking hold. So, uh, that's that's just the way it works. Ben Eisen writing in the Wall Street Journal today about short selling in the market, of which there is not a whole lot. Ben, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Coming up. We can put a big, exciting draw, a movie that needs to be on the big screen in the summer. Grab your popcorn, gang. It is movie time. First, though, let's do the numbers. The Dow Industrial is off 31 points today at 10%, 21,580. The Nasdaq down just to 2 points, 6387. 
The S&P 500 barely got out of bed, hardly changed, 2472. For the week, the Dow off three tenths percent. The Nasdaq added 1.2 percent. The S&P 500 up about a half percent. Last earnings result for GE's soon-to-be ex-CEO Jeffrey Immelt, and not a great one at that. 12 percent revenue drop, although that was better than anybody expected. Shares powered down two and nine tenths percent today, the lowest. Those shares have been in 19 months. Also hit oil field services company Baker Hughes, now mostly owned by GE since it consolidated things this month. Drilled down 2.4% today. Bonds rose yield on the 10-year Treasury note. Held at 2.23%. You're listening to Marketplace. This Marketplace podcast is brought to you by HP. With prices starting at $1,465, HP workstations offer maximum performance through unique technologies, allowing you to go beyond the basics to maximize your productivity and make IT management easy. Plus, HP Z workstations are highly customizable, offering a range of features that you can mix and match to your ideal configuration. Not to mention, HP offers free shipping and returns every day, as well as free customer support 24-7, 365. And right now, you can get an exclusive offer just for listeners. Get 15% off select HP workstations with the Intel Core i5 processor when you go to hp.com slash marketplace and enter the code marketplace at checkout. That's hp.com slash marketplace. Enter the code marketplace to get 15% off select HP workstations. This special discount is valid through July 31st. Whether you have a small business that's looking to grow or you're established and ready to take the next step, HP's workstations with Intel Core i5 processors are for you. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdal. Amazon is getting a little unwanted scrutiny over its pricing practices. As part of the online retailer's bid to buy Whole Foods, Reuters is reporting that regulators at the Federal Trade Commission are looking at whether the discounts that Amazon shows consumers on its website are genuine, shall we say. That scrutiny gets us to this next story, which is that filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission show the company is on track to spend $12 million this year on lobbying, about which two things. That doesn't seem like a whole lot, given how big Amazon is. But also, what are they lobbying for? Marketplace's Aaron Schrank has that one. How does Amazon's spending on lobbying compare to that of other big U.S. corporations? According to the Center for Responsive Politics, it ranked 20th last year. The center's director, Sheila Krumholz, says the company's lobbying efforts are as varied as its product offerings. They're lobbying on taxes, trade, technology, cybersecurity, even aviation, given their drone delivery program. Also, immigration and mobile payments. Amazon sales have been growing by between 20 and 30 percent a year. It makes sense that its lobbying budget has grown, too, says Gil Luria, research director at brokerage D.A. Davidson. He expects spending to increase as new priorities come into view. If they become too dominant in any part of retail, there may be an antitrust concern against Amazon. Amazon is going to want to get ahead of that. President Donald Trump tweeted during the election campaign that Amazon has, quote, a huge antitrust problem. The company is under scrutiny now as it seeks regulatory approval for its proposed $13.7 billion merger with Whole Foods. But most antitrust experts don't see a problem. Well, I think the concerns have emerged simply because Amazon is so big. Herbert Hovenkamp is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Antitrust is not about bigness. It's about the ability to earn monopoly prices by reducing output. And he says Amazon doesn't dominate enough of the grocery business to make that happen. But it keeps expanding into new areas of activity. And analysts say Amazon's spending on lobbying won't go down anytime soon. I'm Aaron Schrank for Marketplace. You know those apps that let you book a hotel room virtually minutes before you need it, often at a big discount? Well, that room is available because somebody else canceled their reservation at the very last minute, which drives the hotels nuts and is bad for the bottom line. And that, in turn, is why Marriott and Hilton have started requiring 48 hours notice for cancellations or you pay a penalty. Marketplace's Rima Crace has that one. Eric Rubant totally gets the unpredictability of business travel. His agency, Sire Travel, books dozens of clients a day, then rebooks them. If a client, you know, calls up or emails to make a change to their reservation, you know, two, three, four, five times, that doesn't even phase us. We're used to it. And to keep big spending corporate clients happy, the hotel industry has put up with it. Jeff Beck worked in the business for years. We would end up going down with rooms that we just weren't able to sell because of it being such a last minute cancellation. Now Beck teaches hospitality business at Michigan State University. We tend to train our customers to act in various ways to their own benefit. 
It started with hotel policies that let customers bail as late as 6 p.m. day of. But over the last few years, apps that show last-minute deals have made the problem much worse. Cancellation rates now range between 20 to 50 percent, according to industry estimates. Airlines learned to punish us for making changes long ago. Why is it taking the hotel industry so long to get tough? In a hotel market, you may have 100 different companies. Cindy Estes Green is with the market research firm Calibri Labs. For each of them independently to make that decision is not nearly as likely. Consolidation is changing that. Marriott controls more than a million rooms. Hilton has more than 800,000. Tighter cancellation rules aren't likely to go over well with business travelers, but Green says they may be good for people whose plans are more predictable. When there are lots of last-minute cancellations... The rates bounce around a lot. So she says stricter policies could mean more stable prices and more available rooms. I'm Rima Crace for Marketplace. Spider-Man? Check. Wonder Woman? Yep. It was amazing. Dunkirk this weekend. Thank you very much. I am three for three on big summer movies playing right into Hollywood's hands. This being a key season along with the holidays for studios to get us off our couches, away from the small screen and into theaters. These days that usually takes big movies. Lots of action, amazing special effects, a giant budget too. Hasn't always been that way though, which gets us to today's installment of our series, Summer, brought to you by... Imagination. Wonderful products. Brought to you by... As Ashley Miltite reports, summer used to be just another season in Hollywood. Janine Basinger began working in a movie theater in eighth grade. It was the late 1940s, the era of movie musicals, and she was an usher. She says 80% of Americans went to the movies once a week then, no matter the season. It was their main form of entertainment. In the old days, the studio system rolled out movies. I mean, let's take MGM in 1952, put out a feature film every week. So for 52 weeks, they rolled out 52 features. Today, Basinger is a professor of film studies at Wesleyan University. She says by the 1970s, movie going had plummeted. Not even the air conditioning could draw crowds. TV was keeping people home. Summers was seen as a cinematic wasteland. Until the summer of 1975. Jaws was set around a July 4th holiday and it was released just as moviegoers were about to celebrate theirs. It was a smash. Viewers went back to the theatre to be terrified again and again. And all of a sudden people thought, wait, we can rethink this. We can put a big, exciting draw, a movie that needs to be on the big screen in the summer. R2-D2, where are you? A couple of summers later, Star Wars was released and became a worldwide hit. Tom Schoen is the author of Blockbuster, How Hollywood Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Summer. He says that movie appealed to everyone. But it was kids in particular that drove the repeat viewings, which was what really knocked up the box office intake. I mean, I can speak as somebody who kind of went back and saw it as many times as I could, like it was just a compulsion. There were no videos, no DVDs. The only way you could relive the experience was by going back to the theatre. He says back then, a blockbuster was literally any movie that had people lining up around the block. It was Star Wars, but it could also be a more sober film like Kramer vs. Kramer. Blockbuster has come to me in a very different kind of movie, one sort of aimed at the younger market with a lot of special effects, spectacle, costing a lot of money, and it's conceived as such. Over the years, he says, people came to expect big action films every summer. And now he says it's almost every week. And today, they're designed to be relished by people worldwide, even if their August is the height of winter. Jason Squire is editor of the Movie Business Book. He says if you think about the marketing costs both inside and outside the U.S. An average of $80 million, in addition to the huge cost of making the movie. So it has to appeal to a huge global audience. That's a very big change and a serious roll of the dice. But he says Hollywood is willing to take the risk because when the rewards are good, they're enormous. Janine Basinger of Wesleyan University wishes studios would risk tweaking the formula. 
After all, she says people clearly do go to the movies during the summer, so why not diversify? Maybe they need more little old lady movies and more challenging intellectual movies, as well as blockbusters. She's seen a bit of everything this summer. The Big Sick, Wonder Woman and Dunkirk. I'm Ashley Milne-Tite for Marketplace. This final note on the way out today in which I put in a good word for the Congressional Budget Office. The CBO is always a political punching bag. The puncher usually being the party that's on the losing end of a CBO legislative score, most recently Republicans and their various health care bills. The punching of late, though, from the White House and congressional GOP leaders has been notable. House Speaker Paul Ryan yesterday called CBO's analysis bogus. I mention that because today all of the former CBO directors, Republicans and Democrats alike, posted an open letter to leaders in both houses, in both parties, objecting, quote, to recent attacks on the integrity and professionalism of the agency. I talked to Keith Hall, the current director of the CBO, a couple of months ago. We talked about that. We've got the interview and the letter as well at Marketplace.org. Hall, for the record, is a Republican. All right, the Dow down 31 points today, about a tenth percent. NASDAQ and the S&P 500 basically flat all the way around. Our theme music was composed by B.J. Lederman. Marketplace is produced by Nancy Fargali. Star Nieves is the executive producer. Deborah Clark is the senior vice president and general manager around these parts. I'm Kai Rizdal. We'll see you Monday. Everybody have yourselves a great weekend, all right? This is APN. This Marketplace podcast is brought to you by HP. With prices starting at $1,465, HP workstations enable you to innovate without boundaries, expanding as your workflow grows. Plus, you get free shipping, returns, and customer support 24-7, 365. And right now, you can get an exclusive offer just for listeners. Get 15% off select HP workstations with the Intel Core i5 processor when you go to hp.com slash marketplace and enter the code marketplace at checkout. That's hp.com slash marketplace. Enter the code marketplace to get 15% off select HP workstations. This special discount is valid through July 31st. Whether you have a small business that's looking to grow or you're established and ready to take the next step, HP's workstations with Intel Core i5 processors are for you. 